Porfirio Diaz, born in Oaxaca, Mexico, he was able to utilize the military to gain power. He became a general and later became a president in 1876 to 1880, and again from 1884 to 1911. Although harsh and controlling, Diaz did not detract from the growth of Mexico. During his presidency, Mexico was politically and economically stable. Described as the Golden Age, the government created railways and telegraph lines in the hope of improving transportation and communication. Economically, Diaz focused on mining and agriculture and opened new banks. Nevertheless, Diaz was militarily driven and therefore sought every chance to strengthen his military. Even when Diaz was not in office, he still maintained tremendous control over the Mexican government. He employed the Nori election slogan to oust Juarez from power, yet ironically, Diaz would eventually mimic his predecessor. As one would expect, the revolution took the country by surprise. After years of stability, Francisco I. Madero, born from a wealthy family in Cohila, challenged the great Diaz. Seeking social justice and democracy, Madero ran for presidency in the 1910 elections. Conveniently, Diaz won the elections with a landslide. He rigged the elections. Madero was furious and was immediately imprisoned. Afterwards, he fled to San Antonio, Texas, where he began writing the Plan de San Luis Potosí. He was in office from November of 1911 to February of 1913. Madero agreed with liberal economic ideas and policies, which is funny because in that aspect, Madero was in agreement with Diaz on something. Madero began to be a leading critic of Diaz and his supporters. Madero came up with the Plan de San Luis Potosí, which was a document to destroy Diaz's authoritarian government and instead began a democratic presidency. However, this document called to do all of this with violence. A rebellion was launched against Madero and his government, and as expected, Madero attempted to suppress them. Victoriano Huerta got involved and actually did a better job at taking out the rebellion than Madero, causing Huerta to gain popularity and Madero to lose some. Madero lost his presidency in 1913 and Huerta was next in line to head the government. Eventually, like in most Mexicans' brutal politics, Madero was assassinated in 1913. Born in Jalisco, Huerta had, from a young age, the makings of a military leader. He joined the military in his teens and entered the prestigious military academy. Diaz highly favored Huerta, and this close relationship influenced his military leading style. He was disappointed when Diaz was exiled, but chose to serve Madero. The embassy pact replaced Madero with Huerta. Huerta had been aligned with Diaz all along, and the government was back to being a militarily driven figure. The revolution was essentially thrust back to the beginning. It had been temporarily overcome. In 1913, Victoriano Huerta joined Bernardo Reyes, Felix Diaz, and U.S. Ambassador Henry Lane Wilson to overthrow Madero from power. Like Diaz, Huerta also rose to power through the military. He initially supported Madero, but secretly plotted against him. On February of 1913, Huerta imprisoned Madero and signed the Embassy Pact. President Woodrow Wilson refused to acknowledge Huerta's presidency on the basis that it was a conspiracy. President Wilson quickly replaced Henry Lane Wilson as ambassador. Hostility began to grow between President Wilson and President Huerta. Wilson had demanded that Huerta step down. The U.S. did not want another dictator like Diaz. After Huerta's refusal, the U.S. and Mexican relations broke down. During Huerta's presidency, another counter-revolution was brewing. Carranza, born in Coahuila in 1859, was an intelligent and honest man. Carranza supported Francisco Madero's revolution and later followed him to San Antonio, where he was appointed governor of Coahuila. 
Kranza was in charge of leading the revolution in his area, but was unable to do so. Carranza amassed support and became president in 1917. Mexico was on the brink of chaos and the economy had been severely disrupted. Carranza began returning land that was expropriated in the revolution and won favor from the people. Carranza distrusted Obregón and sent him away to fight Pancho Villa so he could focus on his rivals Felix Diaz and Emiliano Zapata. In 1915, Carranza ran for the presidency and was recognized by the U.S. He then won the elections in 1917 and promptly began eliminating any threatening leaders. During his presidency, Carranza was able to gain the support of peasants, women, and workers. He worked for their rights and altered the social status of the groups. Unfortunately, Carranza's government became decentralized and he began losing power. So after the Constitution of 1917 was drafted, ultimately the Constitutionalists held most of the power in Mexico. However, Carranza did much more than just write a document to regulate Mexican politics. In 1919, Carranza assassinated Zapata. That pretty well sums up why Carranza lost his power. Dead men can lead nations. How would you say Obregón maintained his power? Well, simple really. He used political patronage, great wealth, and personalism to win over Mexico. The U.S. companies withdrew due to his increase in taxes, but he still maintained his power over the constitutionalists. He was a pretty big racist, though. He thought that the Indians would inhibit his political progress, common thought among many elites. While he seemed to be a pretty good guy, he has still lost his power when a crazed Catholic assassinated him based on discontent with the church-state relations posed by the Constitution. Dying was a big reason for losing his power to Calles, the next present figure to take over the revolution. And like Carranza showed us, dead men can't lead nations. They can't do much of anything, actually.
Mike Caron just showed us, dead men can't lead nations. They can't do much of anything, actually. For this document called to called to do all of this with violence. A rebellion was launched against Madero and his government, and as ex <laughs> That's not even a sentence. So what is- is he responsible for? Over a gun? This is arrested. Then it switches to images after that. I'm gonna finish it, right? Okay. I can cut it. You can begin whatever you want. Oh, is it still recording? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that recording? It's still recording, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, have, we have 30 minutes, so then it just stops recording for some reason. I'm just gonna start a new one. Yeah.